In its setting upon the waters, Venice was born to be painted. It was known as Venezia La Bella, an incomparable union of art and life. A Byzantine historian of the 15th century compared Venice with an exquisitely proportioned sculpture. There is no scene in Venice that has not already been painted. There is no church or house or canal that has not become the subject of an artist's brush or pencil. Even the fruit in the market looks as if it has been stolen from a still life. Everything has been seen before. In the drawings and paintings of Venetian life, from those of Jacopo Bellini in the middle of the 15th century to those of Francesco Guardi in the latter part of the 18th century, the setting and architecture of the city take precedence over the activities of its inhabitants. Who can remember any of the human figures in Canaletto? In the many images of the public processions of Venice, the spectators and the participants become part of the architecture. The buildings themselves seem to embody the harmony and joy of the people. Venice is not so much a city as the representation of a city. There were some who suggested, in fact, that it looked better on paper or on canvas than it ever did in the light of day. Venice might have been composed by a painter seeking symmetry and contrast, weighing the vertical against the horizontal, combining shapes and colors in the most harmonious whole. Latin elements are balanced against Greek elements, Gothic against Byzantine, in order to symbolize the sway of different empires. The sight lines are perfect, as in the stage scenery for a play or for an opera, and the perspective is subtly diminished. The details and motifs are carefully mingled. The coordinates of the public buildings were appraised in the light of Renaissance theories of numbers, so that the vistas have a mystical or magical enchantment. It was another form of power. In Tintoretto's Paradiso, placed in splendor in the Ducal Palace, the figures of Saints Mark and Theodore, of Moses and of Jesus, were placed one to another in the same position as their respective public churches in Venice. A civic aesthetic had been immortalized in paint. Public space had become artistic space. The arrangement of the city was important for those artists who will be forever linked with Venice. These are Guardi's paintings, vedute as we know them, and you can see the primacy of the eye in the city. One of the reasons why there were and are so many balconies and terraces was to provide vantage points from which Venice could be observed. It is sometimes hard to know whether the art imitated the reality or whether the architecture was inspired by the paintings. Venice was made to be painted. We still believe that it has to remain as it is in these paintings that we see over here. 
the work of leading vedute painters such as Canaletto, Giovanni Antonio Canal, went abroad. Now, for the first time in 40 years, a Venetian art historian has persuaded the world's major art galleries and private collectors to lend enough examples to illustrate a golden century of his city's art. We wanted to present again, after the exhibition of 1967, to the people of, uh, of the region of Veneto, uh, an exhibition about Venice and about Canaletto. So we were looking at that exhibition and we decided to, to give it a new cut uh, in terms of just showing the paintings that represent the beauty of the city of Venice. So what we decided to do, it was give an idea of how this uh, period called Vedutism started with uh, Gaspar Mambitel and how he went through uh, Canaletto and Michele Marieschi and Francesco Guardi to, to end the time and, and give people an opportunity of uh, seeing how uh, the city still it's, uh, it's the same one. Canaletto was absolutely magnificent. In the, it's considering the old master, to me, to people that actually grew up in this region, because Canaletto had this view of Venice. He was actually able to, to represent the city uh, at, its, at its best time, you know, with this color, with these lights, with the way the Venice used to be. And that's what we wanted to show here, you know, the beauty of Venice, what they were able to do as a Venetian. It's amazing to think that the emotion that we have watching in this painting is the same emotion they can have standing, you know, at this period of time in this city, which is sort of contains the beauty that he had at that time. Canaletto was able to understand that, and he was able to to just bring it over paintings and, and transport it to, to today. Canaletto started in the theater, and that's where he learns from his father the way that he had to, that he then used again in his career to, to build a painting, you know, to, to construct it, to put it together. So from the building to the architecture to the adding of the figure at the end, the way that he was deciding the color of the sky instead of the water, and that came absolutely from the theater. And uh, that gives to some painting, particularly the one that celebrates the, the, the arrival of the Duke of Gergesa in 1727, who remains the only one able to celebrate the event that took place in that period of time. And, and so the, uh, the Doge of Venice receiving this very important uh, political figures uh, at that time. That it came absolutely from the need of celebrating, and it's a theatrical preparation of the painting. In Venice, art was seen as a communal rather than an individual enterprise. Paintings were worked upon by many hands. A master like Bellini would provide drawings of heads as patterns that others might copy. The same was true in other studios of figure and of gesture. In a city that had pioneered the model of the production line, in the shipyards of the arsenal, such enterprise is hardly surprising. In a city that was established upon the primacy of family too, the artists followed precedent. Sons of Bellini were painters. The studios of Tiepolo, Bassano and Veronese were family businesses. They were clearly created on the pattern of the merchant families of the city, in which trade was passed from father to son. So it is that the workshops created the identity and unity of Venetian painting. 
From the 14th to the 19th centuries, it was a distinct and distinctive Venetian phenomenon. There was nothing comparable in the other cities of Italy. If you think that we're representing something that is our backbone, it's, it's you know, to us, and 95% of what you see here comes from abroad, you know, it should teach us something. This should be uh, something that you offer when you come to a city and you see the magnificence that the art means for our country, particularly for this region. In Venice, the traveller seems to be walking through oils and watercolours, wandering across paper and canvas. It is no accident that the city has also become a traditional setting for 20th and 21st century fiction or film. It is the natural home for the sensational and the melodramatic. Narratives of intrigue and mystery are commonly set in the Cali and Campi of the city. And no one loved intrigue more than the artist Tintoretto, the man who was so full of energy that he earned the nickname Il Furioso. He is a remarkable painter, unique in the Venetian experience. Venetian art is, by most art historians, considered to be firmly grounded in color. Uh, and indeed, uh, Tintoretto told us that he was following the drawing of Michelangelo and the color of Titian. And that light and shadow, uh, which is the essence of his dynamism, uh, is something that shines through and makes him extraordinarily modern and extraordinarily exciting. In the spring of 1564, one of the Venetian guilds, the Scuola di San Rocco, ran a competition for the painting of their hall. Tintoretto and Veronese were two of the contestants. It was agreed that each artist should submit a design for the central ceiling panel of the room. The artists went away and began work, but Tintoretto had no intention of sketching a design. He obtained the measurements of the panel and began work at once upon a large canvas. The artists gathered here one morning with their designs ready for scrutiny, but Tintoretto had forestalled them. He had smuggled his completed canvas into the hall two days before and by secret means had it fixed upon the ceiling where it was to be displayed. When asked for his design, he merely pointed upwards. When the masters of the guild remonstrated with him, he replied that the only way he could design an image was by painting it. He added, according to Vasari, that designs and models should always be after that fashion so as to deceive no one, and that finally, if they would not pay him for the work and his labour, he would make them a present of it. The painting San Rocco in Glory is on the ceiling still. The comments of his thwarted competitors are not reported, although they are not likely to have been complimentary. He had, in essence, played a trick on them. But it won him the commission for the rest of the building. I think the thing that struck his contemporaries most was the tremendous inventiveness of what he did. Uh, Vasari himself, who came and saw it uh, virtually in the course of, of creation, uh, was struck by uh, the originality, uh, but also by the rapidity and the tremendous innovation in composition, in foreshortening, in the representation of figures. All of these things struck uh, Vasari as something like he'd never seen before. It's sometimes said that you can only understand the paintings of Tintoretto when you are in Venice, when you see them in Venice. Is there a truth to that? I think it's very true. In this building particularly, everything here is of the highest possible 
possible caliber. Not all of it of even quality, of course, because he was working alone and without assistance. Uh, but what he did here, I think, uh, is his absolute masterpiece. There's a great deal of drama. Uh, there is a great deal of darkness. And of course, uh, Venice is a city of light uh, and a city of color, there's no question. And these were two things that he eschewed in this particular religious drama that he was displaying here in the school of San Rocco. One of the most astonishing and indeed modern of the, his conceptions in paintings is the extraordinary uh, vision of the raising of Lazarus, where the light in the canvas simply goes around the periphery uh, from the back of Christ's hand uh, to the arm of Lazarus's beseeching sister up uh, to the knee and calf of the man being raised up from the grave. But what is remarkable about that painting, what had never been done before, is the entire the entire center of the composition is black, is empty, representing, of course, the emptiness of death, the emptiness of the grave uh, from which this young man was being resurrected by the miraculous intervention of Christ. This is the sort of thing that uh, many art historians have thought perhaps a theologian had helped him decide upon. I don't believe it. I think it was his own genius, his own ideas uh, that informed so many of the extraordinary ideas behind these paintings. The resurrection of Christ, for example, uh, the resurrected Christ uh, uh, emerges from the tomb in a burst of uh, beauty and glory, an athlete Christ like that of Michelangelo. But the thing that's most extraordinary are the uh, two angels who hover helicopter fashion to lower the great stone down on the ground uh, on to the arms of one of their companions who's literally uh, being squashed by the weight of the tomb. Uh, of course, the resurrection of Christ from the tomb is a frequent motif in Western art, but never before handled like that and never again. Totally and completely original in Tintoretto's genius. He seems to be filled with divine fury, doesn't he? And it, absolutely, fury. absolutely. There's something beyond the human uh, that inspires him. Is that not also true of his fluency and his inventiveness? One thinks of Vivaldi as the same kind of Venetian artist who have this extraordinary fluency. And I think you're right, uh, and a great inventiveness. It must have been an electric atmosphere uh, when they were alive. Vivaldi, of course, in the second golden age of Venice, but uh, these men in the, its first golden age. And I think the way in which they uh, played off on each other, and there must have been a tremendous uh, vitality and a fascination with the novelties and with the inventions and the artistic masterpieces that were being created almost on a daily basis, I suppose. So what would you say, to sum up, is the glory of Tintoretto? Ah, the glory of Tintoretto is anything in this building. And I think a wonderful, exalted energy. You know, he was said alone to have shared this quality with Michelangelo, a kind of awe-inspiring dynamism. Tintoretto was born in Venice, and in that city he would live and die. It owned his being. He was born, lived and died in one little quarter of the northern district, known as Canareggio. He is a distinct example of the territorial imperative, whereby the ground itself helps to shape him. He only left the city once in his life, and then, on a journey to Mantua, he insisted that his wife accompany him. Like other Venetian artists, he was a fervent amateur musician. He painted stage sets and designed costumes for the theatres of the city. His art cannot be understood without Venice. His art is Venice in its purest and most spiritual form. Tintoretto's was a vivacious, exuberant and impetuous art. He was